For those of you who don't know me, my name is Mark Wright. I'm the research director here at the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis. And it's my pleasure to introduce our next two panelists uh, for the day. Uh, leading off, Aparna Martha is going to uh, talk to us about addressing new and old labor market challenges. So uh, without no further ado, let me hand it over. I thought uh, I would talk a little bit about uh, sort of the labor market and the Fed's mandate of maximizing employment and also in the spirit of sort of talking about inclusive growth, talk about the heterogeneity that we see in the labor market. Uh, you know, we, we tend to think of the unemployment rate as one number and, you know, talk generally about labor force participation and so on, but there's actually a lot of di diversity and heterogeneity in terms of who's benefiting from the recovery, who's benefiting from the you know, labor market expansions, that we, uh, labor market recovery that we're seeing, which demographics are being left behind, what are the policy challenges uh, that we face, not just in the short term, but in the long run. Um, so I'm hoping to cover a lot of that uh, and then looking forward to, to questions. So do I just, just do this? Oh, sorry. Uh, so, so looking at sort of the labor market picture, uh, which uh, in the most recent jobs report that the Bureau of Labor Statistics uh, produced, shows that we've come a long way since the Great Recession of 2007 to 2009. Um, again, as I said, there's a, there's a lot of a ton of heterogeneity in terms of who's actually benefiting from the recovery that I'll talk about in a minute. Um, but it does suggest that you know many of the sort of the cyclical trends that that we were tracking, you know, starting in 2007, looking at people who were out of the workforce, people who were too discouraged to look for work, uh, you know, all of those trends have have shown tremendous improvements over the last uh, five to six years, um, uh, over the last ten years, in fact. Uh, but the broad conclusion, uh, I think, from my presentation will be that in order to sustain employment and labor force participation in the long run, we could be doing a lot more. There are, there are lots of challenges that we're still facing uh, as a country, and we can be addressing that and, and making growth sort of more inclusive. Um, so, so this is a, 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 a chart that we produce at AEI, the American Enterprise Institute, where we, which we started doing sort of, uh, you know, just after the Great Recession to see what the recovery looks like. You know, so this is, these are two indicators that the BLS produces in every monthly jobs report. The higher one, the black line, is the U6 rate, which captures workers who are marginally attached to the workforce, who are in involuntary part-time work, people who took up part-time jobs but were actually looking for full-time work, people who are too discouraged to look for work. And as you can see, there was a time when that number peaked in October 2009, that number was at 10%. That, you, know, that you can think of that as, that's not the official unemployment rate, but that's the labor underutilization under rate that the BLS produces. And, this, uh, and the lower blue line is the, actually the official unemployment rate that only counts people who are actually looking for work. Uh, and again, you know, these two indicators uh, have generally been trending in the right direction. Unemployment rates have come down in the most recent reports. We had, again, a rate below uh, 4% which if you compare to sort of the long run, you know, what we thought of as the natural rate of unemployment, uh, you know, that tended to be around 5%. So we're really at very low levels of, uh, of unemployment. Um, labor force participation is another indicator that we've been tracking. Again, there are long-term secular sort of long-term declines in this indicator over time. But over the course of the recession and then the recovery, we have seen modest increases in the labor force participation rate. Uh, and that's, again, something that, that you know, seems to be trending in, in the right direction, at least compared to sort of the pre-recession um, uh, years. Uh, if you look at job openings relative to unemployed persons, again, good news on this front. We now have more openings than we have unemployed people in the economy. Uh, the ratio is actually, uh, uh, you know, above uh, above one uh, after after many many years, where we had many more unemployed people relative to to, to the number of job openings. Um, 
this is something that uh, Neil mentioned earlier in, in the last session. You know, the, the biggest, I think, the positive that we are seeing is that the recovery is finally finding its way down to the lowest wage workers. So, so the most recent data that we, that we see coming out where we, uh, so where we try to split up workers by, you know, their wage uh, quartile, we find that the wage growth has been fastest among low wage workers. So this really tells you that the recovery is taking hold. We're in a very tight labor market. Uh, there's, you know, there's not that much slack. Uh, wage growth is actually now moving in the right direction and not just for, uh, you know, the sort of the higher end and middle income workers, but really for workers at the bottom end of the income distribution. Um, when you look at the, as I said, there is still a ton of heterogeneity. So if you look at uh, the breakdown by different demographics, we still see really high unemployment rates. This is the average for 2018, not just in the latest number, but for, for very young, for the more younger workers, we, we're still seeing very high unemployment rates of above 12%. If you look at the uh, unemployment rate for African Americans, for blacks, that's, that tends to be much higher than for uh, you know, other workers. Um, so there, there are still interesting differences across um, uh, you know, whatever subpopulation breakdown that you want to look at. Um, uh, this is another interesting thing, and the reason I put in this chart is, you know, we're seeing all these uh, sort of anecdotes and stories in the newspaper about how recruiters and companies are now trying to go after populations that they traditionally wouldn't be looking at. So, you know, people on, on disability, disa you know, uh, disabled workers who are now, uh, companies are trying to figure out, well, how do we get these workers back into the labor force? How do we accommodate them in, in, in our organizations? Um, um, so, so lots of interesting sort of, you know, differences across labor force uh, groupings. One of the, uh, you know, challenges, again, looking at workers at, at, at different ages, one of the interesting things I found was you look at the baby boomer generation, and we and we tend to talk about the baby boomers as people who are okay, they're they're about to retire. You know what's going to happen as these workers retire from the labor market, and you know how long can we sustain labor force participation? The interesting thing to me is that just over the past year, if you look at data from the BLS, it suggests that nearly 40% of all employment gains were driven by Americans aged 55 and older. So, so yes, we have an aging population, we have an aging workforce, and that will be a challenge at you know, maybe a, a decade down the line. But what we're seeing right now is that these workers are also very actively participating in the labor market. Uh, the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis notes that all of the increase in employment between 2000 and 2017, nearly 17 million jobs, has been among, uh, among this category of workers. So again, the older, you know, what we think of as older workers. And these workers are continuing to participate in the labor market. Uh, their share in the labor force has continued to increase. Uh, you can see we've broken this down by workers who are 65 plus, workers who are 55 to 64, and workers who are you know, just 55 plus. And you can see across all of these uh, dimensions, across all of these categories, um, older workers are now becoming a much larger share of the labor force. And these trends are expected to continue. So this is the demographic that's going to see the biggest increases in labor force participation, which to me was a hugely surprising uh, you know, finding, uh, that between 2014 to 2024, the uh, labor force growth rate of these baby boomers between the ages of 65 to 74 and 75 and older is expected to be faster than for any other age group. So on ge in general, I think we're projecting about a 5% increase in labor force participation across uh, you know, the entire workforce, and these workers are growing at rates much, much higher than that. Now, there could be several sort of good and bad reasons for this. One could be that workers just haven't, you know, these are, during the recession, these workers were the worst hit. You know, they, when they lost their jobs, they did not get rehired at the same rate as younger workers or people who had been, um, uh, you know, who are sort of in the middle working prime age uh, participation rates. Um, other studies suggest that, you know, people are just wanting to work longer. You know, these, these workers continue to want to participate in, in the workforce at really high rates. And some of it could also be just, you know, a function of their retirement savings. 
So um, all of this suggests to me that, you know, on the one hand, we think of the economy as being very, labor market as being very tight. And there are, you know, all these indicators that suggest that the job openings rate, the, you know, the wage rate increases amongst lower wage workers, um, you know, all of the other uh, indicators that we just saw. But at the same time, there, there does seem to be this worry, you know, that we can't sustain these higher, uh, you know, labor force participation rates. And yes, there are other challenges that we need to meet in order to actually continue to boost labor force participation among certain demographics. So how long can we sustain these LFP rates without uh, addressing sort of basic policy issues is the big challenge to me. And how do we sort of make this growth and how do we get this economy moving for all workers, make it more inclusive? Um, so some of the challenges that I, that I wanted to talk about are sort of this mismatch. We hear this term uh, a lot about the skills mismatch between workers and jobs. So if we have all of these job openings and, you know, six million workers and about, let's say, you know, six million job openings, why aren't these workers matching with these jobs? What's the mismatch that's causing the, that, those matches to not be made? Uh, and, and here I'm going to talk about the skills issue, the sort of the geographic immobility of workers uh, and racial mismatches. Again, something that's uh, starting to get studied more. Uh, another issue I want to talk about is, you know, boosting women's labor force participation. This is something that I work on uh, in my, in my uh, sort of my mandate at AEI. I look at issues that are holding back women's labor force participation in the economy, things like policies addressing paid leave and affordable childcare. Uh, and also sort of barriers to opportunity and mobility and looking at, you know, workers with previous criminal histories, you know, how do we assimilate them back into the labor market? So this is something, you know, that we've studied a lot. I think economists have a pretty good understanding of just how globalization, technological change have affected job opportunities for workers with different skills. And what tends to come out, uh, you know, study after study is that middle skill workers are the most likely to have been affected adversely through globalized, uh, you know, changes in, in global markets, uh, through uh, automation and technological change. And, and now we also understand that the Great Recession actually hit middle skill workers a lot more than it hit higher and higher skill and low skill workers. They experience sharper and more longer lasting uh, employment declines. And in general, middle skill workers seem to be more sensitive to the business cycle. Uh, and, and this sort of feeds into, you know, all the other uh, areas of concern that we talk about, you know, declining male labor force participation rates. What, what explains that? And we have a ton of, you know, we look at things like the opioid crisis. We look at uh, you know, what's keeping uh, men out of the labor force. But it does seem to be that, that, the, the, that this link between polarization and non-participation is actually getting a lot more attention. So, so workers who are, who are middle skilled, you know, studies find that they're much more likely, if, if, if they're during the recession, they were much more likely to move to non-participation rather than trying to either upgrade their skills and become more skilled so that they can fill, fill the, you know, the skills skilled positions that employers had open for them, uh, nor were they very likely to take up lower skill jobs. And so what you, what you tended to see was that these middle skill workers tended to just drop out of the labor market at much higher rates. Um, so how do we ensure that these middle skill workers actually transition to skill jobs and actually upgrade and invest in, um, you know, in, in training and, and um, skill acquisition and not just decide to, to leave the labor force? So this is just a chart showing you what male labor force participation um, ha has looked like over the last about 10 years. Um, this is, you know, so, so that's interesting because when President Trump sort of campaigned on the promise of bringing job backs, and, and this is all linked to the debate on globalization and the fact that, you know, we said, well, a lot of these manufacturing jobs have actually gone overseas because of, you know, because companies, uh, you know, were benefiting from cheaper workers overseas or, you know, they were looking for skilled workers here and they couldn't find them. And so, you know, workers actually lost those positions. I think what gets lost in that talk about, you know, the manufacturing uh, sector is that actually manufacturing is continuing to create 
you know, employment. We, we still see, uh, uh, you know, average monthly job openings have increased from 293,000 to 466,000 um, between 2005 and, and 2018, while at the same time, employment and manufacturing has continued to decline. So, so when you look at the, you know, sort of the, you know, the, the conversation around manufacturing, we tend to think, well, manufacturing is not creating jobs. And actually, that's not true. What's actually happening is that a lot of these jobs that are being created tend to be for skilled workers. Manufacturing itself has become, uh, uh, you know, a more skilled, uh, uh, the, the kinds of jobs that employers are looking for require much more skills than they used to require. And this is not just in the U.S., this is actually happening globally. We have a study in the Journal of Economic Perspectives that shows that there's been a global shift towards the value added by high skill workers in manufacturing and a shift away from low and medium skill workers. Uh, and so again, in order to match workers to these positions, you know, we, we do need to think a lot about what exactly are the skills that employers are looking for and what is it that's lacking in uh, sort of the current labor force, uh, in the skill set of current workers that, that is leaving these job openings, that, that's leaving these vacancies open and, and not really allowing workers to match with these positions. Um, again, with respect to automation, uh, uh, we, we, we're seeing you know, studies, and of course this is very tough to estimate, but we are st seeing studies that say that you know, automation will actually lead to a decline in jobs created. About 45 to 47 percent of jobs in the U.S. are likely to be susceptible to automation. So dealing with sort of the technological challenges uh, that the economy is facing, in terms of more skill upgradation for existing workers, figuring out ways that workers can complement the skills that will be required in the future so that they, you know, those workers are not, uh, they, they, that they don't lose those jobs, but they actually work better with the existing, with the new technologies that are likely to come in, I think will be a key challenge uh, sort of facing the economy going forward. Um, when we look at sort of younger workers, uh, what again, this was, you know, uh, studies that came out during the Great Recession showed that workers who were graduating during the recession actually had worse career trajectories than workers who had, you know, sort of come out into the labor market in a boom, in an economic boom, or in, uh, you know, even periods of relative, sort of not uh, a financial crisis. And so when you look at these younger workers, and again, going back to sort of the, you know, why unemployment rates are high for this, for this demographic, it's likely that a lot of these workers were coming out at a time when those jobs were not plentiful, when those jobs did not exist. Um, and, and so figuring out just how do we reintegrate these workers, you know, they're facing the fact that they did not graduate into a labor market, did not get that first job that was high paying, did not set them, you know, onto a good career path is now leading to a situation where we have workers who don't have the required, you know, who are not building up assets, who are not building up savings and wealth, uh, and are likely to not be able to build uh, at the same rate as previous generations. Um, so how do we sort of deal with, with these challenges? I think one of the policy ideas that seems to have a ton of support across the aisle is something like paid apprenticeship programs where workers, especially younger workers, can be matched with firms, uh, uh, you know, given, be given training for a period of two years, on-the-job training that, that actually teaches them the skills that employers are looking for, um, and then can, can actually be employed in those positions as they graduate. So we're seeing some interesting experiments in, in places like South Carolina and many other uh, you know, states across across the country where, you know, the government is sort of incentivizing these programs through employer tax credits, uh, but, but, but which are actually seeing, sort of seeing good results in terms of matching workers to jobs um, and, and actually, uh, you know, helping students not graduate with a ton of student debt, not, but, but, but with actual skills that they can apply into the positions that, that, uh, that they are being trained to, to come into. Uh, Again, going back to the manufacturing issue and again to younger workers, I think what's interesting is also that, um, you know, a lot of younger workers just don't see themselves, uh, you know, taking up these manufacturing jobs. And, and there, there's an interesting study out from the, I think, the Institute of Manufacturing 
that says that the reason, you know, we, we have all these vacancies and we have all these younger workers and maybe it's not even a skills issue because a lot of them are trained, are qualified, are skilled, but they decide that they don't want to occupy these positions because the image of these jobs is that these were the dirty, you know, factory jobs of 30, 30 years ago. And this is not the kind of job that, you know, their parents want them to take up. And so what, you know, the, what the manufacturing, uh, you know, people in, in, this, in this industry are actually trying to do is also try to change that image of what manufacturing is today, that it's high tech, that it's not a factory job, that it's, you know, you get to work with machines and you're not actually, uh, you know, you're not on a factory floor doing some assembly line, um, you know, job. I think all of that also has to change in order to make these jobs more appealing to, to a younger generation, to, to these younger workers. So there's all sorts of interesting, you know, reasons why these mismatches are, um, happening. Uh, so as I said, you need, you know, you need a two-pronged approach. One is, of course, this investment in skills and training and, uh, you know, making sure that workers have the skills that employers need, uh, but also tackling sort of this image gap issue, which, uh, which happens not just in manufacturing, but in a lot of the skilled trades where the positions are actually decent, you know, high paying, um, you know, people have, uh, have a decent life, but there, there's just this lack of demand for those positions because of the image that people have about those about those jobs. Um, again, when it comes to sort of older workers uh, and the fact that they are continuing to participate in the labor market at such high rates, uh, you know, it's, it tells me that they could also be a solution to the skills gap issue. So these workers are experienced, they've been in the industry for years and they have, you know, the exactly the training and the experience that that employers are actually looking for. And what we're starting to see more of now is that companies are actually investing in, uh, you know, retraining programs or uh, sort of retaining these workers in the labor, in in the in these positions, so that they can train younger workers, so that they can continue to fill those jobs. Um, and so, um, you know, these are all sort of good policies that I think will help us sort of boost labor force participation, but also continue the labor force participation of workers who have uh, been, in the, in, been in the economy for, for, for a long time and have actually helped sustain the increases in labor force participation that we're seeing. Uh, finally, you know, we, we know that technology can hurt. We, we talk a lot about automation and you know, technological change and how that has hurt middle skill jobs. But at the same time, we also know that technology can help. And, we're seeing all these platforms that, that workers are using in order to match with jobs, in order to you know, supplement incomes. And, uh, and so you know, it's likely, I know that it's not a huge share of the economy right now, but it seems likely that demand for these kind of jobs is, is going to grow. And so just figuring out you know, how do we make sure that the new jobs that are coming up in these new technology platforms are actually... Uh, you know, jobs that workers can, uh, you know, get a decent living from, can actually, you know, figure out a way to do, to, to, to get good benefits from, not necessarily from the employer, but through other, you know, associations, through pooling, um, uh, you know, will, will be interesting to, to track as well. Um, now, again, when it comes to sort of the average sort of barriers to opportunity, and again, this came up in, in the first panel, that a lot of times, we're focusing on, uh, you know, the outcome, uh, outcomes in the labor market. You know, who has a job, who's left behind, who has higher wages, who doesn't. But a lot of that is actually set much earlier in life, uh, you know, in terms of what access you had to good schools, what access you had to a social network that helped you get that first job. You know, how far do you live away from a good job or a, or a good school? Uh, you know, what, what does your community look like? All of those are very key to understanding the labor market as it is today. Uh, and so, uh, uh, you know, we, we can look at inequality. And again, inequality, as I said, you know, we, we're still trying to really understand what inequality means. Is it, we can compare the top 1% to the bottom and say, oh, inequality is widening. But then we also, you know, we can look at, uh, again, inequality amongst a certain demographic. Um, and uh, or you know even just measuring inequality in different ways and realize that we don't you know have a particularly good understanding of what inequality looks like. So to me, the focus has always been on sort of the barriers to opportunity. You know what is really holding people 
at the bottom? How do we get them to move up from you know, their, the bottom 10 or 20 percent? How do we get them to move up to the top? And not really you know, worry so much about the growth and incomes at, at the top because, yeah, you know, as long as it's as long as we have sufficient sort of you know regulations in place to make sure that a lot of that is not unfair inequality to some extent, uh, focusing in on economic opportunity to me has always seemed like a uh, like a more interesting policy question to try to address. And fortunately, we now have a ton of sort of good uh, you know new research out there trying to track just what opportunity looks like in the U.S. today. Uh, so we have um, th th this chart from Raj Chetty, an economist at, at uh, Stanford, who, who looked at what does upward economic mobility look like in the U.S.? What is the chance that, uh, you know, uh, that people will out-earn their parents? If you, and this is sort of looking at intergenerational mobility. So what's, what's the likelihood that you will earn more than your parents did at the same age? And this is a striking chart because it says that opportunity is actually declining in America. So if you were born in the 1940s, you had you know, a 90% chance that you would earn more than your parents. Uh, if, today, in, if you look at the 1980s cohort, uh, they, they have less than a 40% um, 40, 40 chance or less than a 50% chance that they will out-earn their parents. So, so really trying to understand just what is it that's holding people back, I think is far more interesting. This is a chart from the World Bank that did a similar thing for the US, but it wasn't looking at incomes. It actually looked at educational mobility. And it said, you know, what's the likelihood that children will, uh, uh, will sort of outlearn their parents or, you know, be more educated than their parents? And we know that education and income are correlated. So again, this sort of, you know, fits into the picture that we're getting for opportunity from the income data that education, educational uh, mobility is also declining. Now, what are all the challenges that uh, you know, countries are, are facing in ensuring that people actually improve uh, their likelihood of moving up the income ladder, of doing better than their parents did, of sort of you know, seeing these um, improvements over time? And it's a lot of the common, you know, the, the, the things that we debate around the U.S. today. So, so looking at, you know, how likely are you to live close to a good school? How, how, what, what does access to good jobs look like? How, you know, what does residential segregation look like? Are you living away from, you know, are you look, living in high poverty areas? Are you looking at living in low poverty areas? Um, you know, so, so addressing, I, I think it will, it requires sort of this, uh, you know, very comprehensive look at just all the challenges that households are facing, not just in the labor market, but even before they reach the labor market, uh, that will really help us address and understand these, um, these issues. So, so looking at spatial mismatch, uh, you know, the fact that you live away from uh, good jobs is, is shown to address, is shown to imply that you would have poor economic mobility. The fact that people are less likely to move across the U.S. for jobs, uh, you know, this is again showing up in the data, um, shows that, you know, that's, that's a big reason why the mismatch is happening, where we have these openings, but they're not in the same areas where people are looking for jobs. Um, that's a big reason why, uh, you know, those labor market matches are not happening. We also have interesting research on the racial mismatch, so the fact that you could live, live in a good area with a good job, but you still find that, you know, if, uh, that blacks tend to have poor, poorer sort of, uh, you know, job outcomes than, than whites. And it's hard to explain, you know, why that's happening, but, but you know, it shows up in the data all the time. Um, so, so we need to have more policies that would address those kinds of mismatches. Uh, we've seen interesting experiments looking at moving to opportunity. What happens if you give families a voucher that lets them move from a high poverty area to a low poverty area, and we and we we can see that they experience much better economic outcomes. You know, expanding public transit so that people can actually move to areas where where the jobs exist, or or you know, move to sc or find schools that uh, that are better for the children. Uh, uh, I'll just go quickly over the, you know, the issue of women's labor force participation. Again, we're seeing, you know, we've seen tremendous increases in women's labor force participation over time. 
but more recently, we, we are starting to see more research come out that suggests that women are participating in the economy at lower rates in the U.S. relative to, the, relative to other developed economies. And a big reason for that is the lack of um, you know, access to policies like paid leave, where you can get some paid time off when you have a baby, when you have caregiving needs, or you know, if you fall sick. And so a lack of access to these policies and affordable childcare is actually holding a lot of women from actively participating in the workforce. Uh, we're also facing uh, you know, challenges where uh, sort of lower uh, children growing up in single parent households, spe specifically single mother households, are much more likely to be born in poverty. And that poverty tends to uh, you know, persist across generations. Uh, finally, on the, you know, the safety net, you know, we saw that over the course of the Great Recession, people did access uh, you know, transfers like TANF, unemployment insurance, food stamps. So the, the you know, safety net is working as it should, but we also have a ton of ways that we can improve the safety net. You know, if we have work requirements, how do we make sure that people have the training to actually fill the, you know, fill the jobs that they, that they require to take up even in order to access the safety net, um, you know, can we do something, can we expand the on-income tax credit so that people can supplement incomes at, at the lower end, um, you know, and expansions of other credits that, that benefit uh, lower-income households. And, and just very quickly, you know, again, with the opioid e epidemic, uh, this is an issue that has affected labor force participation rates, not just for men, but also for women. And we're seeing much greater increases in overall opioid deaths for women. Uh, you know, since the CDC first started tracking this data. So again, I feel like this could be another challenge uh, in addressing economic mobility. And the, and the last thing, you know, looking at uh, incarcerated, previously incarcerated workers and trying to assimilate them back in the labor market is another hu huge challenge. You know, a lot of times the support services that, that, these workers, that these workers need to come back into the labor market are missing. So again, lots of sort of... Um, you know, key takeaways, uh, just there's a ton of heterogeneity in terms of the policies that we need to adopt to ensure that growth is sort of more inclusive and, uh, uh, you know, that we don't just look at the aggregate number, but look at heterogeneity within that. Thank you. Um, I'd like to thank the organizers for uh, the invitation to come present here. It's a real honor. Um, I normally respect the rule that you shouldn't apologize for the presentation you're about to give, but I'm going to break it in this regard. Um, I think I'm going to make a lot of the same arguments that Jared Bernstein would have made today had he been able to attend today's conference. He'd have made them better. So if you're deciding whether or not my presentation is useful or persuasive, maybe multiply it by like 1.5, and then you can um, figure out what, what its real level should be. Um, so what are the arguments I, I'm going to talk about today? Um, what I want to do is basically say um, that the data says the benefits of aggressively targeting really high-pressure labor markets are still underestimated. The first part of my talk is going to be to talk about these benefits. I think there, there's broad acceptance that, yes, low unemployment is better than high unemployment, duh. Um, but the degree to which like, they are progressively targeted, the benefits, and hitting workers at the bottom of the wage distribution and getting to uh, communities of color, I think are still underappreciated. I think that really should be a part of the utility function of macro policymakers. Um, and then the second part is I want to say that I think the risks of pursuing really high pressure labor markets for an extended period of time have really relented in a way relative to previous decades that are also not fully recognized. And so when you look at those sort of risk rewards, I'm going to argue um, it leads to you know, what, what would I want the Fed to know? I, exactly that. The benefits of that pursuit of really high pressure labor markets are large and progressive. The risks have relented. Um, so I'll just start with um, reviewing the evidence on the progressive benefits of tight labor markets. I'm going to start with just the, the obligatory uh, inequality chart. This is a very familiar stair step of income growth between 1979 and 2015. You've got the top 1% average annual growth on the right. You've got the bottom 90%, the, the second bar from the left. Um, why do we care about inequality? I mean, I'd say at least three reasons. One is just sort of diminishing marginal utility of income. I think $100 matters a lot more to someone at the 20th percentile than someone at the 99th percentile. So I think all else equal, an economy that takes that money away from people at the 20th and gives to the top is a bad thing for, for welfare generally. Two, I think, and I'm hoping I'll be a little bit convincing with this, is that the dynamics that have caused this rise in income inequality 
they've either been zero or negative sum. Um, and so I think we can just do better. I think we have an economy with at least as much output, but also has more enjoyed by people at the bottom and middle, and so that's better for welfare. And then three, I think the rise in inequality is now sharp enough that it actually has real macroeconomic implications in terms of what it means for generating sufficient aggregate demand to keep the economy pinned at an acceptably low level of unemployment. So th those are the three real reasons. Um, so this rise in inequality I'm showing right here, this actually takes into account taxes and transfers. We all know, though, it's a much larger rise if you only look at market income. I think one thing that's maybe not well recognized is how much of the root of the rise in inequality is in the labor market. And so this is a graph we like to show at EPI. This shows hourly compensation growth for non-supervisory workers. It's basically 80% of the private sector workforce. It includes non-wage compensation. Um, and this is economy-wide net productivity. Happy to tell you why we care about that instead of other measures of productivity. But it's essentially um, average income generated in an hour of work in the economy. And for 30 years after World War II, these two measures moved almost in lockstep. And then you see this big delinking. Less than 30% of this delinking is about different price deflators. There, there is some of that in there, but it's less than 30%. Um, basically, about 60% of this delinking is inequality within the wage bill. And so basically, it's the fact that the bottom 80% of workers have been losing relative to people in the top 20% of the workforce. Um, and about 15% of this wedge is the shift from labor income to profit income. I think this is pretty important because Often people want to use the sort of aggregate labor share as a measure of sort of workers' bargaining power or something like that. That is really mushing together very different kinds of workers. The top 10% have really done fine and I think have bargaining power and leverage in the labor market even when unemployment is 6 and 7 and even 8%. The bottom 80%, I'm going to argue, really need quite low rates of unemployment before they can exercise any real ability to get wage growth at all. So I think this is important. This is not a measure of the labor share. This is a measure of basically the bottom 80% kind of labor share. Um, and so basically, you can think about that wedge between productivity and hourly compensation for the bottom 80%. It, it's, that's it, income that went somewhere that was not the paychecks so of the bottom 80%. And so that wedge is the rise in inequality. Um, sorry. And so what changed in say, the 1970s to sort of help these things become delinked from each other, I think this is part of the story. This is a measure of the, the NIRU as estimated by the Congressional Budget Office. That's the relatively smooth light blue line. And this is actual unemployment is the dark blue, more jagged line. Um, and it's a little hard to just eyeball from the chart, but in the 30 years between 1949 and 79, the actual unemployment rate was a cumulative 15 points beneath the NIRU. In the 28 years between 1979 and 2007, the actual unemployment rate was 15 percentage points above the NIRU. And so basically, we were much more successful in keeping the economy, on average, it's jagged, there's a lot of, I'll give you the spreadsheet if you want to add it up. Um, we were much more successful even before the Great Recession. This is not a story of the Great Recession. It got much worse after that. But even um, just if we're talking about 2007, we were much more successful between 1949 and 79 in keeping the economy, on average, closer to the NIRU, actually a little bit beneath um, than in the 28 years afterwards. I think there's an argument to be made that, you know, one, the NIRU is just, it's, a, it's not a great guide for policy because it is so imprecisely estimated. And I think the, the bias is even, it tends to be too conservative in terms of the unemployment rate that is genuinely consistent with, with stable inflation. But even if it was exactly right, it basically means that it was overshot consistently after 1979, and that matches pretty well with when you see that delinking start to occur between productivity and hourly compensation growth. Um, and so that's two big broad time periods. You can even look within two states, though, or two time periods within the post-1979 years, though, to look at the importance of high pressure labor markets for wage growth. We did have a brief episode of really tight labor markets in the late 1990s. Um, and this is basically average annual wage growth for that period of time, 1996 to 2001, versus average annual growth in every other year after 1979. And I've got the 20th percentile, the median, the 95th percentile, that first dark blue bar. Wage growth was strong and really equal in those five years where we had really tight labor markets in the late 1990s. In every other year over that time, 
Wage growth was really weak, but especially for the median and below. Um, and so I think this is, again, there's the two time periods, and then there's also this episode within the second time period where we actually managed to get a brief episode of tight labor markets. Um, we can go a little more granular with some microdata to test the correlation between wage growth and measures of labor market tightness. And that's what we've done in a paper that I stole this from. Um, and so basically what we did in this paper is we looked at a panel of states um, since 1979, and we looked at wage percentiles by state and measures of labor market slack by state. And why we wanted to do that was if you just look at the national data, you get an unemployment variation between like 4 and 10%. If you look across states, it goes from like 2% to 17%. And so we were thinking maybe we can actually capture some more episodes of genuinely tight labor markets. Maybe we just get better estimates. Um, and so just focus on those three bars on the left there. This is the response of um, hourly wages to a one percentage point increase in unemployment. Um, and basically, you see, again, a much larger response for the 10th percentile, a slightly smaller response for the 50th, and even smaller response for the 90th. Um, these are between the 10th and 90th responses. Those are statistically significant at the 95th uh, level, 95% level of significance. Um, the difference between the 10th and 50th, close but not quite, but the stability of these coefficients, like the ranking of them, is really robust to throwing out these states or these years. And so this, this is a really um, clear pattern that the lower your wage is, the more responsive it is to unemployment. And so the further you can push unemployment down and hold it, the better you're doing for the wage growth of people at the bottom. So it turns out, besides just looking at wage percentiles, this, this broad pattern holds if you look at uh, differences between median wages for workers of different races. I have actually grabbed the wrong slide from a colleague's paper for that one. I, I grabbed the wrong slide because the magnitudes are exactly the same as, as the wage response. This is actually the unemployment response. Um, but so believe me, and I'll show people the paper, if you look at sort of the median uh, wage for black workers and the median wage for white workers, the median wage for black workers is about twice as responsive to changes in the unemployment rate as for white workers. And you might be tempted to just say, well, that, that's just a function of the fact that, you know, the wage percentile rank, basically the, the median uh, black wage is basically at the 35th percentile in the white wage distribution. It's not. It's actually an even bigger response than you would get just from um, doing that. I mean, I think the very loose theory is basically that employers' taste for discrimination is pretty cheap when workers are plentiful, and that taste becomes a lot more expensive to maintain when labor markets get tight and very few potential workers are, are applying for jobs. And so I think there might be some real possibility for tight labor markets to really sort of batter down employers' uh, discriminatory labor market practices. If you look at other measures of labor market health by race, you see progressive benefits of tight labor markets. Um, we kind of know that in good times or bad, the ratio of black to white unemployment is essentially two to one. But if you look there at the EPOPs in the middle, um, this is a overall employment to population ratio and the prime age EPOP. This is what um, the group specific EPOP change in response to the change in the overall. You see, especially in the prime age EPOP, um, black workers or potential workers' responsiveness to changes in the overall EPOP are about twice as large. You actually decrease the ratio. You're, you're helping push together relatives, not just absolute gaps in those measures. Um, and so I think just that, that sort of bit of folk wisdom, it's true, but folk wisdom that, you know, the unemployment ratio is always two to one, good times are bad, that can make us actually overly pessimistic about the benefits of really tightening up labor markets for, for closing sort of race-based uh, employment gaps. Another really key margin of adjustment to tight labor markets is hours worked. Um, basically, if you look at the change in annual household hours worked, and so this is like you know, if you have multiple potential workers in a household, more uh, they both have opportunities to work. Um, basically, as the unemployment rate um, increases, you see a greater fall in the hours of households uh, headed by African Americans. Um, same thing with other measures of labor market tightness. This is sort of robust across different measures of tightness. Um, and as I'll say in a second, these hours worked are a really important uh, margin of adjustment. I think we, where I work sometimes, we focus on hourly wages a little too much. We're really obsessed with getting hourly wages. 
you know, your, your annual income is, for most people, is a function of how much you make per hour and then how much you work. And how much you work is very much conditional on the, the, the health of the labor market. And so a colleague of mine, Elise School, did a paper a couple of years ago that basically asked the question, in 2013, what would happen to the, the market-based poverty rate if wages for the bottom 20% of households had matched the overall rate of net productivity growth since 1979, so that big wedge I showed earlier had never happened, and if hours worked for that group um, matched the level that was last seen in 2000, when it was just a sort of unambiguously tight labor market. Um, the results are pretty dramatic. I mean, that combination, she shows, you know, what if just wage growth, what if um, wage growth and, she's calling full employment, the, the, the hours issue. Um, and so basically, market-based poverty, if you get the, the hours of full employment and we actually get broad-based wage growth matching productivity growth, it falls from about 19.5 to 15.3%. Um, how big a deal is that? You know, it's more than four percentage points. If you look at the entire apparatus of government transfer programs, they reduce poverty by about eight percentage points. And so basically, you're talking about, you know, full employment can match about 50% of the effect of our entire anti-poverty effort in the United States through, through transfer programs. To be clear, expansionary macro policy is never going to be a full substitute for targeted anti-poverty programs. It shouldn't be. We should beef up those programs. Um, but we can actually make a big dent along the way by um, targeting more high-pressure labor markets. And so these are the, the benefits of really tight labor markets. And I think they're, they're widely recognized, but still, I think, a little bit unappreciated. I think. Um, the other issue is the risks of pursuing these high-pressure labor markets have really relented in recent years. Um, basically, I think there is this idea among central bankers too often that our primary job is to be ahead of the curve on inflation. I mean, even in 2000, I think it was 15 or 16, um, was it Richard Fisher who had the metaphor of shooting ahead of the duck? in a speech, and the idea was that, yeah, inflation looks low today, but if you ever start to let it sort of turn the corner, you're gonna find yourself behind the curve, it's gonna be hard to restrain, and so we really need to be very preemptive in making sure that we never let sort of the wage price spiral actually happen. And um, you know, to be really blunt, I, I think that's very 1970s style thinking, which we had a wage price spiral in the 1970s. That episode happened, and I think um, it very much informs a lot of thinking today. I think the idea, though, that wages and prices um, are ever going to start quickly chasing each other ever upwards in this sort of spiral um, applies to a different economy than we have today. And this is just a table of summary measures of the different economy. Basically, the institutions and the economic environment that empowered workers to, to respond to price increases with enforceable demands for wage increases, and so you had this sort of leapfrog of Prices go up, workers demand higher nominal wages, so firms don't want to let their profit margins get reduced, so they rise prices. Um, it's hard to see that happening. I mean, basically, if you look at the five years before the 1970s, um, you had American workers who had gotten over 2% real wage increases for about 15 years. That's what they were used to getting, and that's what they were able to get. Um, if you look post-1979, if you're looking at um, real wage growth of sort of non-supervisory labor, it's not even a tenth as fast. We do not have an American workforce that is really used to getting really rapid wage increases. The, their wage aspirations are just because they've been disappointed for so long. Um, part of the issue is going into the 1970s when we had that episode of wage price spirals, the unemployment rate over that five year period averaged 3.8%. Over more recent periods, unemployment's been much higher. Loose labor markets are really tough on, on workers' bargaining power. I think another issue is unionization rates. Someone mentioned in the earlier period, um, we've had a huge decline in union coverage in the United States. And of the union contracts we have today, there are almost none that are fully indexed for inflation. That used to be a thing in the 1970s. You got a COLA. Inflation went up three, your COLA went up three. There is almost not a union contract out there that is explicitly indexed fully like that. Um, Federal minimum wage is much lower as a share of sort of typical workers' wage than it was going into that period. And then I think a key one, this is a, the import share from less developed countries. It is widely recognized that 
as trade expands with poorer countries, that can be depressing for wage growth for sort of non-college labor in the United States. That was a trivial factor going into the 1970s. Less than 1% of GDP was accounted for by imports from less developed countries. That is no longer a trivial factor. Um, and so basically, I think this is basically the, the, the tinder for the wage price spiral episode we had in the 1970s, and it's just not there today. And of course, even that tinder in the 1970s needed a spark of some kind. And that spark was basically two oil price shocks and a collapse in productivity growth in the economy. Um, so on the one hand, productivity growth, we see it was much faster going into that period. And you might say, all else equal, that means it was less inflationary. But it had a long way to fall. And you can see it fell from 2.9 to 1.5. I would argue from today, it doesn't have that much it doesn't have a big distance to fall. And in fact, there's plenty of reasons to think productivity growth should actually be going a little faster in the future. And so basically, I think we have switched from a world that was around in pre-1979, where a real primary task of policymakers was restraining aggregate demand to make sure it didn't always run ahead of the economy's productive capacity, to one where the real trick is generating, not restraining, aggregate demand growth going forward. I think this is the, the hypothesis of the sort of literature that people have called secular stagnation, which is just such a terrible name, but it's a really good insight, I think. Um, and this, it's, it's this hypothesis. This is um, basically the effect of federal funds rate over business cycles. Um, and since the 1980s, that's just been steadily falling. Um, why has it been falling? I think we have a pretty good reason. I mean, there's probably a bunch of reasons why. But I think one of the reasons that we know is that there's the feedback of the big rise in inequality that we've seen. And so this is the macroeconomic implications of rising inequality. This figure shows the average savings rates between 1989 and 2016 by income percentile. And I did this with the Survey of Consumer Finance, which, as was mentioned in a previous panel, it has really good identification of high-end uh, households' incomes. And this is a measure of the acquisition of net financial assets, so it's a pretty good proxy for savings. Um, and so basically, concentrate on that sort of top 1% versus the bottom 80%. An enormous difference in average savings rates. The difference between essentially 3% and 45%. And then remember that we transferred about 7 percentage points of income from the bottom 80 to the top 1% over that time period. You multiply those two things together, and you get a drag on income growth, all else equal, of something like 3% of GDP. I mean, that may not sound huge. The biggest boost to the Recovery Act gave the economy was not 3%. Well, may have been. It was in the middle of estimates of the boost that the Recovery Act gave. And so basically, this means all else equal, aggregate demand growth, because of inequality, is about 3% slower in 2016 than it would have been at the beginning of this period. <clears throat> of course, all else wasn't equal. You know, how come we're not in a permanent recession if that's true? Well, one, we just steadily lowered interest rates over that time to sort of make up for this. But now we seem to be bumping up against zero a lot of the time. And so that's a strategy we probably don't want to rely on too much going forward. And then we had a couple asset market bubbles that supported spending in that time period with the stock market bubble of the 2000s and the housing bubble of the well, little later 2000s. Um, and so I think the coping mechanisms that kept this rise in inequality from being just super visible every day in sort of an aggregate demand slowdown um, are not ones that we should rely on too much going forward. And so again, this is the, the sort of feedback loop of inequality for why I think we should care about it. And then I think there's also some sort of potential, let's call them hysteresis-like effects going on. Really long periods of wage suppression lead to reduced wage aspirations at every unemployment rate. And so you need ever lower unemployment just to keep workers' wages from falling in real terms. Um, oh, and this comes from a speech that Alan Kruger gave at Jackson Hole in 2018 that if anyone has not read it, you should read it. It's basically the argument that I'll try to demonstrate in the next slide. We've basically had a reduction in workers' bargaining power and leverage over the past generation. And that matters not just for their own wage growth, but it also means that monetary policy should be more accommodative because it's ever harder to generate wage increases and aggregate demand growth. And the way Katz and Kruger demonstrated this in a paper in 2000 is they estimated something called the uh, unemployment rate consistent with zero real wage growth, an acronym I will not even try to pronounce, but that's what they called it. Um, and they basically backed this out by doing a regression of wage growth on the unemployment rate lagged inflation, productivity, 
Um, and this is for the median worker. And so basically the way to read this is between 1979 and 1988, at 6.9% unemployment, median workers were getting a zero real wage increase. So anything beneath that, they'd get some positive real wage increase. Anything above that, they'd get a negative. But 6.9% is what got you zero. Between 1989 and 2000, that fell by a full percentage point. So now 5.9% is what's needed just to get the zero. Anything above that, your wages are falling. I extended it for 2001 to 2007, fell again, almost another full percentage point. And so as a measure of sort of the secular long run pressures pushing down wage growth at every unemployment rate, I think this is a good measure of that. I've had people ask, you know, is this true for 2007 going forward? We now have 10 years of data. I would like to do it. This is a slight digression, but it's moderately interesting. Basically, the, the very high unemployment and the really low inflation in the immediate aftermath of the Great Recession just completely broke wage Phillips models. Um, and so this is just the orange line, sorry, the blue line, is this regression's prediction of nominal wage changes over time. The orange line is actual nominal wage changes. This model works great until you hit the Great Recession where it starts predicting nominal wage growth should be really steeply negative for a couple of years. It started to converge a little bit. Maybe we get more years of data and this can be useful again, but why don't I have this updated for the more recent period? It's because this episode just sort of killed our statistical um, ability to do that. So, yeah, and finally, one last potentially mitigating factor for why I think we can be really aggressive in pursuit of high-pressure labor markets without worrying about inflationary effects. I mentioned before, um, I think there is some upside to productivity growth in coming years. I think part of the upside is, in fact, if faster wage growth actually comes, that might incentivize employers to invest in labor-saving technological change. Basically, productivity growth has been really weak since the Great Recession hit. I don't think that's a coincidence. I think the Great Recession just battered down wages and it made employers really complacent about, I don't need, labor costs are not the thing I have to worry about. I have to worry about every other cost, but workers are cheap. Um, finally, in the past couple of years, workers have, are no longer cheap. They're actually starting to see some um, wage growth. In the past, wage growth lagged has led to subsequently faster productivity growth. It's basically a spur to employers that your labor costs are rising, what are you gonna do about it? One thing they do is they do more investment in capital equipment and other processes that can um, save on labor costs. And so this is a scatter plot just showing the lagged growth in real hourly compensation on the horizontal axis and average growth in uh, business investment on the vertical. And you see lagged Real compensation growth does tend to be a spur for um, firms to do some investment and in increase productivity. So basically, in the end, um, oh yeah, just one last thing. To be really clear, um, I think we're now in an era where we can be much more aggressive in sort of pursuing high pressure labor markets. I'm not super happy about this. I mean. I work at an institution that's really committed to raising workers' wages, um, and I don't think it's a great state of the world where you need super tight labor markets to get any wage traction at all for the bottom 80%. Um, this is not an era that I'm sort of celebrating. But you know, you make policy in the, the era you have, not, not the one you want. Um, I would love to be back at a time where even at 6% unemployment, most workers could see real wage growth. And I'd love to be arguing about how, you know, are there other ways to contain inflation that happens at 5.5% rather than raising interest rates? I'd love to have that discussion, but I just don't think that's the era we're in. We're in one where workers' bargaining power and leverage has just been so decimated that white-hot labor markets are kind of the only way the bottom half actually gets some wage growth. Um, so I think I'll just end with a quote that I think um, really nailed this sort of wane of progressive benefits versus potential risks, and this is from Glenn Lowry in uh, 2000 in a paper he wrote. And he basically is making the claim that, you know, it's not just aggregates that should go into the risk-reward calculus of, of policymakers, it's also the distribution of benefits. And so he is writing in response to, or in the context of African-American unemployment rates, and basically he says, can we reckon it is a good policy um, would it be legitimate to tolerate a somewhat greater chance of inflation while maintaining a strong demand for labor because doing so also manages to hold the unemployment rate of black youth at humane levels for the first time in a half century? Um, 
I think these are the kind of questions we should be asking. And I don't think this is only a question of aggregates. I think we also need to think about the what I think are the clear progressive benefits of really going for high pressure labor markets. And I think I will end there. I'm happy to take any questions. So before we take questions from the audience, I thought I might just try and kick things off by um, by posing a couple of questions directly. Um, now, I'm, over, I'm guilty of oversimplifying a bit here, and I, I may be even guilty of putting words into people's mouths, so I apologize <laughs> if that's true. But Aparna, it, it seemed to me that the thrust of your argument was that we're pretty, labor markets are very tight, and that there's not much that can be done short of removing structural barriers in the economy in terms of further increasing uh, employment, whereas Josh, you are arguing, I think, that um, there's still a big role for macroeconomic policy, aggregate demand management, to substitute for some of these policies, imperfectly and only partially, perhaps, but nonetheless to substitute for them. So I wanted to ask you both, is that a fair characterization of your views? And if we think it might be hard to generate a, a menu of policies for dealing with these structural issues, is it possible that uh, macroeconomic policy would uh, do better on a cost-benefit sense? and of, of being able to deliver some of these changes? So I think, you know, my argument was more, yes, we have a tight labor market, but even in a tight labor market, there's a ton of heterogeneity in who's benefiting and who's not. So I think just looking at sort of the, oh, this is the unemployment rate, and, uh, you know, that's why we need uh, sort of more interest rate cuts or we, uh, whatever mon monetary policy we need to adopt, I think is sort of missing the picture because even with tight labor markets, you can still have very high, as we see, black unemployment rates. We can still have you know lower labor force participation rates for let's say disa disabled workers or formerly incarcerated um, workers and so on. So I think addressing uh, you know and, and Josh. Uh, I, I think mentioned that I think sort of you know the Fed can can have monetary policy that accom that that is accommodative and that actually stimulates the economy. But I think at the same time we also need complementary sort of policies that would actually be more targeted and more you know sort of targeted uh, towards anti-poverty uh, policies that can actually help the lowest wage workers. So so yes we can you know we can get some amount of wage growth even in a very tight labor market for the lowest wage workers but I think we need to be doing a lot more to sort of expand and have more universal sort of high labor force participation rates across all demographics. Yeah, so I agree with a lot of that. I would say a couple things. I mean one uh, my policy wish list goes well beyond tight labor markets. Um, that said, I, I, I do think, and I'm very, I'm very happy that we've macro policymakers have allowed labor markets to get as tight as they have been. There's been a lot of counter pressure from 2014 on with people declaring full employment reached and it's time to worry about other things. And so I've been very happy that that has largely not um, held the day. But I, but the fact that those calls were happening says this is a live debate, and so it's important to be in. And I would say we, I don't think we can even diagnose some of the more structural problems until we actually manage to generate inflation at or above the Fed's target. Like, how much of, say, the rise in inequality is measured by, like, the 90-50 ratio? How much of that is a skills gap? I don't think we have any idea how much of that is a skills gap until we are unambiguously at genuine full employment, which I'm going to define as, you know, hitting the Fed's inflation target. And I would, I would argue even more ambitiously, we should probably hit their, their price level target, claw back some of the large you know, undershooting of inflation that happened. But if you look at the, you know, if you take the results literally, which you probably shouldn't, but take them seriously, and so, some of the regressions, I mean, the difference in average unemployment between the sort of pre-1979 period and post, it's like a full percentage point or more. And you take the regression coefficient, you look, and that basically says we could have had wage growth for the median worker like 0.5 to 0.6 faster in that time period. That's like half the productivity compensation wedge that, that I showed on the earlier graph. So it's not everything, but it's a lot. And I don't even think we know the extent of other problems until that one is actually solved. And so I, I think it's a lynchman. I don't think it's everything, but it's the thing that lets us diagnose how big the other problems are. So I'll just ask a second question for you both. So in the first panel this morning, we heard from Fatih that uh, one of the biggest changes in labor market dynamics is that uh, changes in earnings seem to become more permanent. 
And so do you think there's a role for maybe some of the structural uh, barriers that you're talking about, Aparna, to be driving that increase in permanence? And likewise, Josh, do you think macroeconomic policy has played a role in that increase of the permanence of these shocks? Do you want to go first? Sure, because this one I definitely don't know. I mean, I would say um, I've never had a real stake. I mean, because I've never been very informed, but I've also not had a stake in sort of the, the debates about earnings volatility. And so I, I thought it was fascinating, but I'm still processing it. I mean, I would say he showed a graph of, I think, uh, it was like earnings inequality of 25-year-olds mm -hmm. and showed that it was substantially higher today than 30 years ago. And, uh, you know, I think there's, there's two possible ways to interpret that. One is, you know, because people are so, so young and have little labor market experience at 25, that's like a pre-market inequality measure. That's not obvious to me. I mean, that to me could be the labor market those people are graduating into is a much more unequal one. And part of that inequality, you know, I think could be the, the state of the labor market in macro terms that they, and so I think that it was really fascinating, but I'm still trying to wrap my head around what it means for the argument about tight labor markets. Right, I mean, I think, you know, the, so I don't know where, what the permanence of earnings is, is coming from. I, I think what we've seen in the income volatility uh, studies that, that are coming out is that income is very volatile for the lowest wage workers, even today. Uh, you know, we had an interesting study out from economists, at, I think, at NYU that tried to track uh, low wage workers and just what their income and earnings and expenses look like, and there's a ton of instability there. So, again, you know, the, when you start looking at uh, sort of income, again, you know, what does, what does inequality mean? What do we define when we look at income? There's just, so those are some of the questions that I had for the, fir you know, for the first panel. Like, we, we don't know, uh, you know, inequality could look very different across different demographics. It depends on, you know, as, as he mentioned, you could look at within 25-year-olds and there could be a ton of factors. You're graduating in a bad labor market. What does that mean for your lifetime? you know, earnings uh, and earnings instability. It, it could be, uh, you know, which, um, uh, you know, are you looking at men, are you looking at women? Uh, and again, there could be very different policy prescriptions for what's driving that earnings instability and income instability. So it's hard to say. I think, uh, you know, it depends on exactly what demographic, what data you're looking at. But but I, I uh, my sense is that there is still a ton of income volatility, especially at the lower end of the income distribution. And, and you know, we... I think all of that does tie to having a, a job. You know, a, a, the job is sort of the biggest economic security that a lot of workers have, and we can talk a lot about, uh, you know, welfare programs and, and this and that. But I think the the most uh, the, the greatest stability comes from having a job and having the security of a paycheck. And, and so, unless we address that, I think volatility will continue to be an issue. Great. So let me open it up for questions. Uh, we have the microphones coming around. <laughs> Hi, uh, my question is for Josh Bivitz. Uh, a lot of the exhibits you showed us early on showed us this clear uh, relationship between changing changes in the unemployment rate and how that affects the labor market outcomes of di different demographic or racial groups. So do you have a sense if the identification of those effects really comes from periods when the unemployment rate rises versus falls? Because it seems like the monetary or general policy implication would be very different under those two scenarios. So the only, so in terms of like checking for different time periods to see what's driving the results, I mean, the most obvious one we tend to check is post-2007 and, and before, because, and actually all those um, estimated results get weaker um, if you include the post-2007 period, precisely because they're predicting steeply sharp negative nominal wage, um, and so it's actually not picking up. I would argue that the full depressing effect of unemployment on wage changes. I think in terms of, but I think what you're, tell me if I'm wrong, but your question is sort of getting at is, I think there's a couple issues in how we think about monetary policy specifically in labor markets. I mean, in the first panel, a couple of the, the presentations, it was a lot about monetary policy shocks. And that, that's, I, I understand why people do that, because you can measure it, it's, it's very clear. Um, it's not obvious to me that that is the primary way that the Fed actually affects the labor market. Like, in a sense, if they're shocking the labor market, they're doing something wrong. 
Um, like there should be some anticipation of their actual policy moves. To me, it is more the judgment call they make sort of deep into a recovery about do we need to worry about inflation around the corner or not. It is sort of how much they decide to enforce ex ante estimates of the natural rate and how much they decide to sort of let the, the, the data speak and are willing to tolerate inflation coming right up hard against the target and not trying to do um, sort of a, a preemptive response to that. And I don't have a great, and I'd love to hear thoughts, but I don't have a great way to sort of go after that in a regression framework. But I do think I've thought in the past about, you know, should we do the, the monetary policy shock thing? And I just don't think that's quite what I'm trying to get at in the arguments. So does that in some way approach what you're asking? Or? I guess my question is this. I could multiply, I could multiply all your coefficients by negative one, and they would tell me I should be avoiding big increases in the unemployment rate because certain groups are going to be very negatively affected by that. How can you distinguish that story from of avoiding very loose labor markets from encouraging very tight labor markets? Oh, yeah. My, we've checked a little bit to see if there's, all right, so we have added sort of change in unemployment rate and then sort of step in. We don't see too much uh, compelling there in significant. So I think it's a both. I mean, I, I definitely think that in a sense, like I said, I think we, have, we are actually underestimating a little bit the depressing effect of very high unemployment because of downward nominal wage rigidity. Um, but so I think, I think both apply. I mean, I think, and then in regards to like the immediate Great Recession period when we had incredibly high unemployment um, for quite a long time, the Fed tried really hard to do something about that. I mean, I, I put the blame for that mostly on fiscal policymakers post-2011. Um, but I do think it's pretty symmetric in that, you know, the more you raise unemployment, the further you depress wage growth sort of across the board. And so I, I sense, I interpret that as mostly symmetric. Rich? Again, thank you to the organizers. These are two excellent uh, uh, papers. I'm going to drill down on a very specific topic that I think Aparna mentioned, and Josh, I think you've probably worked on it as well. And as a macroeconomist, I don't have any uh, base of knowledge on this, but, but this whole issue of the value of apprenticeship programs, this transition from school to a job, perhaps not requiring a four-year degree, it, you know, it seems from uh, accounts that you read that other countries in continental Europe seem to do that differently uh, than, than, than we do. And certainly when we see in our role as policymakers, when we have in groups of small businesses, employers, you know, they, they talk about the, the skill shortages. And I think, Aparna, you had a chart, which right. is, I had not seen of actually job openings in manufacturing have actually gone up yeah. in the last 20 years. So, so broadly speaking, what, what it, that seems to be sort of a missing, um, a missing part of the job market that would benefit both parties. Yeah. So why, why doesn't more of that happen? Again, it's not a loaded question. I just don't know the answer. No, that's a great question. I mean, I, I think we just haven't had a culture of having students choose between going in for a voca vocational career or choosing to go to college, which tends to, I think, happen much more in Europe, where you make those decisions at much younger ages and parents are comfortable making those decisions. I think in the US, there's still this, you know, uh, sort of this cultural uh, attitude that we don't want our kids to go into vocational college or training at such young ages. We really want them to go to get the four-year degree because that's the pathway to success. And I think what we're recognizing now and what a lot of employers are, are now trying to hone in on is that look, that four-year college degree is not going to help me hire you because it doesn't teach you what I really want you to know. And so having these tie-ups tie between community colleges and you know, regular four-year colleges maybe and, and employers where you can create that nexus between um, you know, em employers and teachers and students to get them to at least take a few on-the-job training, uh, you know, get some on-the-job on training before they graduate into the labor market is key. And you're right, I don't know why it, doesn't, it isn't taken up. It seems to be a bipartisan issue that both sides you know, agree is like really great for the US and for our younger workers and it's something you know, we need to invest more in. Um, and there, you know, there are initiatives that, are, that have been adopted even under the Trump administration where you know, they're all for expanding apprenticeships. So 
hopefully it is something that's taken up more and more because we, we do have to recognize, you know, that this is the growing need and, and there's a gap in the market that we need to fill and that can be filled through apprenticeships. Just quickly, I mean, this is like the, the, the answer of someone who has a hammer and everything looks like a nail. I mean, I do think part of it is that employers have been able to foist all costs, including training costs, onto their workers because they've had such the upper hand, both because of loose labor markets. But the one place where we do have apprenticeship programs in the United States are unionized sectors where employers don't just have their way about everything. And I, that's where I think faster wage growth can be sort of positive sum. I think apprenticeship programs are good all around, but employers sometimes need to be convinced of that. I know somebody's got a microphone and been waiting patiently. I have a question for Josh and a question for Aparna, if I could. Um, Josh, the chart that you showed on um, the Nehru versus the unemployment rate um, pre and post-1970, I mean, obviously one of the big changes uh, that happened around that time was sort of the monetarist revolution, the rise of the natural rate hypothesis. Um, these things certainly seem to inform, um, you know, the current state of macro and inflation targeting today. So to what extent do you think those are linked? And um, to the extent that you think they are linked, are you advocating like a larger shift away from that? And what might that look like in your mind? Um, question for Aparna. On the, on the manufacturing, I mean, one of the interesting things about the manufacturing data is if you look at the relative pay in manufacturing, it's really gone down a lot. So now average hourly earnings in manufacturing are below, you know, national average hourly earnings for all sectors. So how does that sort of uh, play into your analysis? Right. Do you want to go first? Sure. I think I can be quick. I mean, yeah, I, I think part of that shift in 1979 is not a pure coincidence. I think, I think policymakers, central bankers at the time, saw the wage price spiral of the 1970s and said, we're not going to let that happen again. Um, and they decided to be really vigilant about fighting inflation, I, I think to the sort of detriment of fighting excessively high unemployment. And so I think how much of it was like theoretical natural rate versus just sort of central bank pragmatism of we let inflation get out of control, not we let, but inflation got out of control in the 1970s. We have to be super vigilant about that. I am hoping, and so yes, I think the worry that we have to be super vigilant about inflation, I, I think, as I said, I don't think that describes really the world we live in. I think we can afford to take some risk in going for lower unemployment. So I do hope that that sort of outlook that informed that post-1979 shift is, is starting to, to move back. I, I think it is. I, I think you see it in today's Fed, but I hope it sticks. Yeah, on the manufacturing thing, I mean, I, I do think that, again, it's a, it's a skills issue. So where employers are, do get the workers with the high skills, I think there is a ton of, uh, you know, variation within manufacturing about who gets the high wages and who doesn't. But on average, if you're employing workers who, you know, who are still low skilled and who are non-supervisory, I think, you know, average wages have definite, average earnings have definitely gone down and, and it's absolutely true that you can no longer get you know what what used to be considered a high and decent wage in manufacturing doesn't exist for those workers with the same skills today but I think if you're a higher higher skilled worker you do you know you can still make a you still get high high average earnings and you can still you know have a decent wage so it's it's really I, I do think it's you know there is a ton of variation within each industry as well in terms of if you are a worker with, with the right skills, you, do, you can still get a high, decent paying way, uh, job. But if you don't, then you know, there's still a ton of slack and, and workers are, uh, employers are not gonna pay you. So I have the man there and then Neil. Um, back to the uh, apprenticeship school to work transition. This is actually a long perennial in United States labor market policy. When I was at the Ford Foundation, we tried to do a lot of work with community colleges, which tend to actually be the most dispersed mm -hmm. set of institutions we've got in the US, but they vary a lot from state to state in what they see their mission as, whether it's prepping people for four year or doing some industry work. Josh mentioned the union issue, which is certainly explains a lot of apprenticeship, particularly in Germany. The other weakness in the United States, oddly enough, is employer associations. Uh, they don't, they often in states work as lobbying associations on regulatory issues. You can find examples of good ones that really bear down on these uh, training issues, everything from machine tools to health to IT in some circumstances, but it doesn't spread in the, U in the US. And I think that's a mystery for people, why we have these isolated uh, islands of innovation on this kind of transition, but it doesn't spread. It's tied into our federal structure, I think, to some extent. So there are, this is more really a comment than, 
than a question, but this school to work transition issue is routinely raised as a problem. I mean, I'm sympathetic actually with Josh's argument that a combination of unions and really tight labor markets helps you a lot in those regards, and, uh, but there are some institutional issues as well that uh, we need to address and that are actually quite hard to address from a federal level. Actions? Sounds totally I, I, sensible. <laughs> and I also think it's also like when you talk to you know employers who actually want this, it, it is there is a ton of coordination required. I mean, you need to go through the college, you need to go the local, you know, organizations have to be supportive of it. Employers have to be part of the mix. So it, it's also just you know getting everybody to think alike. Neil, uh, one just uh, comment on the apprenticeship piece, then a, a question. You know, I hear this a lot. You know, last week I was in North Dakota. And I had a manufacturer tell me that we've had a diesel mechanic shortage for 30 years. Uh, I, I explained, no, we have not had a diesel mechanic shortage for 30 years. Uh, I think the market's working just fine. Wages will go up, and then I'll believe it. Or I've visited community colleges. I've asked the community college president, why don't you train more welders? Allegedly, we have a welder shortage. And she said, well, we expanded our welding program, and we got no more students. Uh, you know, so it's, you know, the, to me, the price will clear it. And if there's a real price signal, there really is a demand for diesel mechanics, we're going to get more diesel mechanics. It's just businesses want, you know, they want what they want cheap. And if they can't get it cheap, they think it's a shortage. So uh, I guess I think tight labor markets are a big part of this. And you are seeing uh, businesses going the extra mile to train workers or to partner with community colleges because it's in their own economic interest. I just, I don't see any evidence that there's a national policy that can uh, drive this behavior other than a very tight labor market. Um, now, back to the tight labor market. You both said we are in a tight labor market. I'm convinced that we are in a tighter labor market than we were a year ago. I'm not yet convinced that we're in a tight labor market. And when you think about the relative balance of power between uh, firms versus labor, and that's been changing over the last 30 years, workers having relatively fewer, uh, having less power, or when I think about Uber having effectively fracked the labor market, and what I mean by that is, you think about what does fracking do? Fracking gets at pockets of natural gas and oil that were previously inaccessible. They're generally small pockets, but by this technology, they've effectively capped the price of oil. That's kind of what Uber has done. Like most Uber drivers that I talk to, they're part-time workers. I almost never meet an Uber driver who's a full-time Uber driver. So Uber's technology has fracked the labor market by tapping in these untapped pockets of labor availability and in doing so is capping the price of labor, at least in that, in the driving space. And in a sense, that to me also says, makes me question, are we really in a tight labor market? What evidence are we that we, we are in a tighter labor market, yeah. but how do we know we're actually in a tight labor market? So I actually think that you know Uber filled a gap when, or Uber and other platforms filled a gap when the labor market was wasn't this tight, and then there was a ton of slack, and workers were not getting the jobs that they wanted, and so it was actually a good thing, and that, and then that was the period when we saw the biggest sort of you know hype about what's happening with the gig economy and where are all these platforms coming in, and and to me it's always been oh, it's it, it's a supplementary source of income. Nobody wants to think of it as full time work where you know because you don't. That's not how you want you know it's unpredictable. It's uh, you get to feel like the boss, but it's, there's also no guarantee and there's no stability. Um, so, so to me, you know, it, it's a good thing. It's an opportunity for workers to supplement incomes, and and probably as you know, the economy recovers and these workers get back into full-time jobs, a lot of these jobs are actually going to go down, which is why we haven't seen this tremendous jump up in gig economy work. Because if it was all driven by worker demand for these jobs and you know this notion of flexibility and being your own boss, then you should just see that you know skyrocket, irrespective of what's happening in the regular labor market. So to me, it's always been a sort, you know, a supplement, and and the fact that people are now, you know, probably not relying as much on these platforms tells me that it is a tighter labor market, and that you know workers are getting full time jobs and not relying as much on these. So I I don't know what the you know what the Uber phenomena means for. Uh, to me, it still means you know if you're not relying as much on platforms, then you are you are in a tight labor market. You are getting the job that you want, and and we see that in you know the involuntary part time work numbers coming down, people you know, getting out of those part-time jobs and actually getting into full-time work. So yes, it is a tight labor market, and you're right, we don't know what, you know, what, the, 
what defines a tight labor market anymore because you know as josh said three years ago we thought we were at full employment because we hit five percent unemployment and now we're at 3.7 and we still you know we uh, as i showed there's still a ton of workers that who, who could potentially be brought off the sidelines and into the labor market as long as we have the right policy so to me it's really like you know how far can you keep pushing labor force participation till we just, you know, start blowing up and, and then you have to worry about inflation. So as long as we're doing it and inflation is still low, I think it's fine. Yeah, so I, I appreciate that totally. If I called it an unambiguously tight, I will retract that. I mean, to be really concrete, too, I mean, we have sort of defined sort of a healthy nominal wage target. It should be the, the Fed's 2% price inflation target plus what you think the trend potential productivity growth is. Say we think that trend is about 1.5%. Maybe a little ambitious given the past couple of years, but productivity is starting to firm up. That means we should be seeing nominal wage growth of about three and a half percent, just to maintain everything in equilibrium. We're still beneath that, so I, I agree. We're a lot closer to it. We're at like three point two percent, and then I would say, you know, we have a lot of room to run wages above three and a half percent for a while to claw back some of the decline in the labor share of income that we saw during the the early parts of the recovery. So yeah, I mean, I think we could. I would say I would define a tight labor market as probably three, five and above, but I think we can afford a tight labor market for quite a while before you start to see that upward price pressure if we get some of that back from labor share. So yeah, I, I totally appreciate the call for specificity about what tight labor markets mean. Great. Thank you. Well, let me just um, actually quickly follow up on the last comment. Thank you for raising it. And, and what is a tight labor market? I mean, in some sense, we're using some um, traditional metrics of the labor market, like um, the unemployment rate and labor force participation rate. And one might think that it, today we need other metrics. Uh, perhaps, and I think that was what you were raising, is um, kind of the nature of employment in the economy. Um, Aparna, you just uh, mentioned that, that these have not exploded. Actually, I would say that the one thing that we have measured quite well or reasonably well is the platform economy. Yes, that's still small, but it has grown tremendously. Um, and much of this just isn't very well measured. Yeah. I'm going to talk about that in my remarks tomorrow, but um, I, I completely agree that uh, you know it's, it's really unclear and it, uh, the extent to which the labor market is slack or, or the degree of tightness. Yeah. And um, are there other things that we should be measuring to better capture um, you know, employment and the nature of employment and the degree of slackness. Anyway, and then just let me quickly pick up on the comment um, made earlier about uh, the uh, job openings in manufacturing. You were kind of saying these are, have been um, grown quite a lot. At the same time, employment has not grown mm. or barely grown. And then you kind of went on to suggest this was a, a a reflection of the skills gap. And I'm not sure mm. that the data actually that you're citing support that or that one can jump to that causal inference. You know, it's also consistent with there um, being low wage growth or, you know, v relatively low wages. And I've had the opportunity to, to talk to a number of manufacturers in the Midwest in, in recent years, and that does appear to be quite a problem. And indeed, you know, it's, it's, it's still the case that there are some pretty, lots of traditional uh, assembly line jobs. Yeah. Some are still dirty yeah. <laughs> and dangerous, and those wages have not gone up, and that appears to be at least part of the problem. Anyway, I'm not sure you can, you can jump and say it's just a skills gap. Yeah, and I absolutely did not mean to imply. I, I just meant that there is a mismatch, and some of it could be driven by the skills gap, because like the, inst the survey that I'm citing from the Institute of Manufacturing, which actually did go after employers and did ask them, you know, what do you think? Why is, the, why is there this gap? Why aren't you matching workers? You know, why aren't you hiring? And a lot of them do say it's skills. Now, of course, some of it could be, oh, we, oh, we don't want to invest in training. You're absolutely right. And you would do more of that if it were a tighter labor market. And you would want to, you know, you, you could, employers could address the skills gap issue themselves by getting workers on and training them. So that, that's true. Some of it is driven by, you know, employer attitudes towards how do we, you know, what do we want to do with this? 
Um, uh, so, but I don't want to completely negate that there could be tons of other factors. You know, if, you, if you've had a weak economy and employers are not willing to raise wages just to get you know, workers into those positions, that could absolutely be playing a role in the demand for these jobs, just as the, you know, the image issue of, I don't want to be in this, uh, you know, I don't want to be a plumber, and I don't want, my parents don't want me to be one. So it could be a bunch of uh, factors. So it's definitely not just the skills gap, but I do think the skills gap plays a role. And, and you know, the skills gap can again be an issue that could be easily addressed through employer or investing in training because they think that these workers, you know, will stay on for a, for a long time and the returns to that investment in training will, will pan out. Or it could be that, you know, they just do, are not willing to make those investments because, you know, it's not an economy where yeah, they want to raise wages or, or make those investments. So it could be a combination of different factors. Absolutely. So I'm afraid we're out of time, but please join with me in thanking our panelists. Thank